Mr. Lolly Berté, could you please play an accordion? No, I'm not playing accordion. Is he crazy? I don't want Jeez, this guy's wanted me to play accordion for the past two, three months. What is that? I don't know. I don't like I have to, you have to find my accordion. This is, dude, this is, but it's a beautiful one. Come on, Max. I'm tired. It's a Russian, <laughs> a Russian instrument. This is the spacecraft Soyuz TMA-16 crew. Cosmonauts are getting ready for the flight to the International Space Station. For the first time ever, there is a professional clown among the crew members, Guy La Liberté. He's missing a note here. Yeah. <laughs> At 14, he ran away from home. Then he was just roaming around the world for 11 years. At 25, he founded his own circus. Nowadays, he's the owner of a circus empire and a billionaire. Guy is the seventh Earthling who bought a trip to the orbit. Observing the parachute, descent in standard mode. Brake engines are worked in standard mode. Ground contact is on, landing is completed. The first one to be pulled out of the spacecraft is traditionally the crew commander, later on the flight engineer, and only then the space tourist. Gila Liberté steps onto the scene already wearing a clown nose. He seems to be taking a bow. Victory. The most challenging circus number of his whole lifetime is now over. Alles up in front of the camera. I would like Guy La Liberté to say a few words in Russian. He promised to learn several Russian words during a couple of days. <laughs> He'll be training to the limit. He'd better try harder, otherwise we shall consider whether to send him back to Earth or not. For the first half an hour, right after the landing, he keeps silent. Ten days logged in space must be definitely strike an emotional experience, even for the world-famous clown. Now one needs to regain consciousness and realize that you are back on Earth, the weightlessness is finally over, and that body has required its normal weight. Bear in mind that space flight manager's jokes are nothing more than jokes. What a pity, though. Several hours later, the first ever space clown would say, I'm still soaring in clouds. And a little later, he would admit, the most amazing sensation is the smell of fresh grass once the hatch was opened. A burst of applause, mascara, the improvisation has paid off well. First and foremost, due to having been thoroughly planned in advance. Emergency, fire on board the ISS. As a result of a short circuit, electric wiring is set on fire. Inflammation is spreading instantly. Emergency situation mode is on. The fire signal went off, smoke all around. Luckily, it's a fire drill. Canadian billionaire Guy La Liberté faces a rather challenging task. In less than four months, he has to master a new profession since a clown should become a proper spaceman. The crew to set about the station abandoned procedure. This walk with gas masks on may seem odd only to a random spectator. As a matter of fact, it's been absolutely strictly calculated. Walking from one particular training room to another precisely corresponds in its energy expenses to the efforts to be applied by cosmonauts for an immediate evacuation in the orbit. Reach the rescue module, put on the spacesuits, undock from the station and fly away. Back to Earth. Moreover, it's a supplementary endurance test. Working for three hours in this mode, cosmonauts usually lose up to five kilos. It's hard even for top professionals. La Liberté has to feel double pressure due to the fact that it's his first joint training with the crew. Furthermore, flight engineer Jeffrey Williams, an American astronaut, was initially against space tourism itself, and Guy is perfectly aware of that. 
NASA astronauts' discontent echoes an international scandal that happened to take place in the United States during the first space tourist flight preparation. It would start unraveling in Houston. On March 19, 2001, the Russian spaceship crew was conveyed there to work on the ISS American Segment Simulator. At the U.S. Mission Control Center, as well as an American court, filming is strictly prohibited. The reason why everything that took place then reached us by means of submitted drawings and witnesses' recollections exclusively. On March 19, 2001, it was announced to the Russian cosmonauts that NASA Administrator Daniel Golden had ordered to replace the third crew member. Instead of an American citizen, a millionaire, but above all, the first ever space tourist, Dennis Tito, they must step aboard a professional astronaut. There was a grave hitch. Everyone lapsed into silence. At last I asked if it was NASA leader's final decision. Afterwards, conversations were both in English and Russian, but a compromise would never be found. The NASA management was deeply opposed to an amateur's flight. Thus, the decision on a crew complement alteration would be made notwithstanding Moscow's preferences and without a single endorsement. In those circumstances, the Russian space team commander proposed the only correct solution. Crew, stand up and leave the room after me. Although Denis Tito hardly understood a word of Russian, he saw us rise and walk out, so he jumped up and ran away past us purely instinctively. It was the very start of the enormous international confrontation between NASA and Roscosmos. Initially, Americans did not mind space tourism. In the mid-70s, President Reagan even invented a marvelous show supposing to send a schoolteacher into the orbit so that she could give a lesson from space. A rather fine idea ended in a real tragedy. January 26, 1986 is a dark date in the U.S. Space Exploration Chronicles. The Space Shuttle Challengers lift off. Six astronauts and primary school teacher Krista McAuliffe aboard. For the first time in history, she was meant to give two lessons from the orbit addressing entire humankind. Krista's whole class would be present at the launch pad on that day to see their beloved teacher fly up into space. But on the 73rd second of the flight, somebody at the observation point would scream in horror. Oh my goodness, what's wrong with Challenger? The space shuttle exploded and tumbled into several fragments. All the crew members died. After this accident, the U.S. Congress resolved not to let unqualified subjects participate in space flights due to the high incidence of risk and the wide public implications arising in such cases. This is the reason why the Russian part's intention to send Denis Tito to the ISS bumped into such an active counteraction of NASA. Besides, the USA was not going to yield the pioneer's palm to Russia. The NASA management was conscious that they are missing another chance to be the first. So they did everything what it took to prevent our space flight. Consequently, it was the continuation of an all-time space race. But in case of Dennis Tito, Americans could hardly complain about the Russians. The flight was supposed to be carried out by the Russian spacecraft Soyuz. Spaceship's crew was appointed in Russia. On the ISS, Russia is as an equal partner as the USA. Besides, space speaks Russian, after all. Mr. La Liberté, could you please read this text? And what is it? A Russian song, I guess? Yes, that's the Russian space chanson. Illuminator. 
Hello, Manatore. Manatore. Oh, oui, oui, oui. Welcome to the Russian cosmonauts group. Russian language seems to be the hardest subject in space tourist preparatory program. But Canadian billionaire Guy La Liberté is twice puzzled thereby. At 14, he abandoned school and later on never tackled any studies. C'est bon? <laughs> <laughs> Frankly, I find it difficult to write even in French, my native language. I'd rather swallow fire instead. Guy La Liberté still plays with fire. His school of life was that of a street artist, plain and rough street laws. Every day one had to earn his living. So did Guy by entertaining passers-by with his accordion, stilts, tricks, and fire swallowing. I would say the only things that I've been missing, uh, maybe uh, uh, compared to the time that I was a street performer, is that sense of liberty uh, that permit you a morning when you wake up to decide to go east, west, side, uh, you know, north, up, left, right. Nowadays, Guy La Liberté is one of the most famous modern artists. He has a big family. He was twice married and both times happily. He became the father of six children altogether. As for the wives, history is silent, but Guy adores his heirs. But most important, uh, I made a point in my life that every day I wake up, I have one goal in my day. It's to make laugh my kid at least once every day of my life. And how do you usually succeed in it? Any type of thing, I just told you. It's just like at the breakfast, I would uh, uh, put the egg on my head and crash it. And... Well, these days, Guy the Free, that's how one could translate his French surname, celebrates his 50th birthday. But he's not going to rest in content with what's been already achieved. I've got to fall in love with a Russian girl, then it would be easier to learn Russian, Guy says. <laughs> By the way, a few words about girlfriends. Thanks to a space flight, another space tourist, Charles Simony, succeeded in marrying a millionaire's daughter, famous Swedish model Lisa Pear's daughter. Charles Simony is almost a Soviet man. He was born and grew up in socialist Hungary and was dreaming about space since he was a kid. This was in the, in the 60s when, when I was uh, still going to school and, and um, I was uh, uh, very interested in space like kids are and I've, I've learned everything about space. I've learned the names of all the dogs uh, from, from Laika. Hungarian schoolboy Charles Simony was a real champ at space-related subjects. At 13, he won a school astronomy contest and was awarded a trip to the Soviet Union as the main prize. <music> Moscow amazed Charles Simony. He got on a rocket-shaped bus that conveyed him throughout the city streets. He was even allowed to touch the first space suit with his own hands. But later, something almost impossible happened. A children's concert at a TV studio in Shambolovka dedicated to the Cosmonautics Day. That is a film miraculously remained intact, which displays young Charles Simony among other pupils. After that, the main thing took place. Charles met one of the most legendary people at the time, one of the first Soviet cosmonauts, Pavel Popovich. I was telling my brother that, um, that I always wanted to touch something that was in space. And at that time, you couldn't go into museums or, or to, to see anything connected with space. And really, Pavel Popovich was when I shook hands with him. In several years, Charles Simony would head overseas to the USA, panelists, with nothing but a student's visa in his pocket. In 1981, together with another poor student named Bill Gates, he would create a computer company, Microsoft. It's under his guidance that would be developed the software Word and Excel, presently known to all PC users around the world. On April 7, 2007, Simony became the fifth space tourist and the second Hungarian who reached the orbit.
When this computer genius was taken out of the descent module, he would decide at any rate to find that very Russian cosmonaut whose appearance in Charles's early years had changed his life forever. They would meet again half a century later. Pavel Popovich could hardly recognize the adult Charles, the Hungarian pupil he saw only once. There were thousands of similar encounters in a renowned cosmonaut's life, to say the least. But still, Pavel Popovich was very glad. I think that they would share a 30-minute conversation and then part, having wished each other good luck. Later, Charles would fly to space again, whereas Pavel Popovich on September 29, 2009, would depart this world just a few hours before the Soyuz spacecraft was launched, carrying the space tourist aboard. Russian riot in Texas. Russian cosmonauts are committing sabotage against the program of international space cooperation. In spring 2001, NASA was trying the darndest to prevent Dennis Tito's spaceflight. When the Russian cosmonauts crew slammed out of the American Space Center, a real hysterics broke out, spreading gradually throughout the American media. The Russian cosmonaut strike in Houston became a breaking news topic of world-leading TV channels. Talgat Musabayev and Yuri Baturin came to know it at the restaurant. There were TV sets all around broadcasting something like breaking news. The Russian crew refused to fulfill NASA demands and went on a hunger strike. Meanwhile, we're sitting there and stuffing our stomachs. On the one hand, that particular news the Russian crew had heard at dinner was beyond any criticism. Russian cosmonauts are not able to strike as they have nothing to do with the NASA personnel. Nevertheless, the broadcast words turned into a real threat to Dennis Tito, an American subject and a NASA engineer in the past. Tito. Tito rather suspiciously treated not only NASA representatives, but U.S. officials in general, as he knew undoubtedly that NASA was surely against him. There was always a bodyguard by his side. He was constantly awaiting some provocations. As far as I can remember, he dreaded some assault and even expected his arm to be broken on purpose. Piece of cake, and the question would stand no longer at all. In fact, someone on the phone in a hotel room did really promise Tito to crash his bones down in a dark side street in case he didn't leave that stupid idea of a space flight. Dennis took it as seriously as to when there are huge sums and the reputation of the world's two main space powers at stake, a single individual's life no longer enjoys such a significant value. There was a whole escort of limousines and Lincolns accompanying Tito. With a whole bunch of heavily armed security guards on the lookout. Meanwhile, NASA Administrator Daniel Goldin gave Moscow an ultimatum. I remember it perfectly. At that time, we were in the United States on training. When the scandal flared up, Mr. Goldin, the NASA Administrator, said that either Dennis doesn't fly up, or we abandoned the program. It was formulated that tough. The Americans insisted that a tourist aboard the ISS would distract the crew from the implementation of difficult operations, and in case of emergency, his presence would be a death-defying threat. Thus, it would imperil the whole international space project in general. The crew commander expressed an essentially different opinion on the matter. I'm telling you now, and I did the same thing then, that our crew was so well prepared and so accurately coordinated that it's all the same to us if there is a space tourist or a suitcase on board the ship. The whole world expected the final scene of the scandal, wondering if the Russians would send the tourist into space or step back. Though Moscow was not empowered to make arrangements at the American Space Center, the reason why Russian cosmonauts were ordered to proceed to trainings in Houston without Dennis. The dream of Tito's whole life was collapsing. It said that those sentenced to death experienced their lifetime flashback. Something of that kind occurred to Dennis. On October 4, 1957, in Queens, a New York City district inhabited by immigrants, a 16-year waiter of an ice cream parlor was listening spellbound to the radio and charmed dropped a tray with plates. 
broken dishes cost was equal to his daily wages. The young man was thrifty and tried to save up some money for studies, but he was almost indifferent to what had happened. It was nothing, as he was entirely grasped with the news transmitted by the radio. The USSR placed in orbit the first artificial satellite of Earth. The guy's name was Dennis Tito. Later on, he would call the 4th of October the birthday of his dream. In 2001, an offspring of Italian immigrants, a sweet toffee saleswoman from Kunis and a printer's employee, bought a space trip for $20 million. Suddenly, there emerges Nasser, an insurmountable obstacle which bars the way of fulfilling his dream. The first space tourist was forced to defeat an external adversary. The seventh one, Guy La Liberté, has to push his own limits. In this particular situation, Guy La Liberté is developing his endurance, which Guy boasts in abundance. 25 years ago, he started from the ground up and managed to build his own circus empire brick by brick. Just starting Cirque du Soleil was a, a big mountain to climb. We were a bunch of kids, you know, in the early 20s. Uh, the only experience we had was the experience of life we had. Uh, we had no management uh, or big business expertise. Sometimes he had to face some bitter truth. For instance, that it's hard to match a fine dream about circus with hungry children. Many times we thought that we will not survive uh, the next day, business-wise. One day, Guy wavered and turned off the trace road. Fed up with fighting against the need he lived in and searching for regular earnings, Guy got a job on a hydropower plant. It was dull enough. But Guy was sure from now on his kids would not go to bed hungry. Despite tidy sums of money, I had to quit due to a strike. <laughs> Looking at Guy making grimaces, his lively facial expressions, it may seem that he is not able to be serious at all. In fact, it is nothing but a disguise behind which there is hidden an iron-willed personality and a true toiler. A story of hard living, with certain variations included, can be told about any of the seven space tourists. But perhaps the most peculiar fate was granted to the sixth one. Richard Garrett, American astronaut Owen Garrett's son, did not manage to step into his father's shoes since he was forbidden to become an astronaut by doctors. The ability to get into space myself for almost 30 years, uh, ever since I was very young and my father was an astronaut, uh, but NASA told me as a child that uh, because of my poor eyesight, I would never be selected as an astronaut. Richard's family used to live in a NASA cottage settlement where virtually every second man was an astronaut. Space was the common subject of home chats. At night, the boy had eaten his heart out not to burst into tears. He knew he'd never be as much of a hero as dad and his mates. Richard wanted to lift off from the ground so badly that he was ready to give his life for that dream. Since I was a young child, I have commonly said that if uh, the director of NASA were to come knock on my door and say, there is a ship leaving Earth today, it will never return, and you do not get to say goodbye to anyone you know, you have to leave right now, I would go. Luckily, he didn't have to sacrifice his life. One day, Garrett Jr. was stricken with a brilliant idea. If he can't head to the real space, then he can invent a toy-like one. Then Richard gathered a million of like-minded dreamers, and they went together into a virtual space journey. In this game, this is referred to as a massively multiplayer online game. And what that means is that everyone who buys and plays this game plays together at the same time in a vast virtual world that we have created. Computer games with a space plot brought Richard a fortune and made a starlit road unfold before his eyes. The, uh, and in fact, it, it does relate to my father a bit in that I sent this actual necklace, uh, one of the few times I've ever had it off of my neck, was to send it up on uh, Space Lab, uh, the uh, ninth launch of the shuttle, uh, for a month in space. 
And so even though this would be my first time into space, my father already took this for me into space uh, back in 1984. On October 12, 2008, one of the most successful computer designers and games creators, the sixth space tourist Richard Garrett, fulfilled his infantile oath. Garrett, the father, worried about his son more than anybody else. Actually, his heir did step into his shoes and became the first American astronaut in second generation. Finally, the descent module touched the ground. Landing was a success, a long-awaited encounter. Well done, son, said Owen Garrett, the astronaut, to his son Richard Garrett, the cosmonaut. I am proud of you. Thank you, Dad. Eyes closed. A physical health is an important but still not the sufficient prerequisite for a space flight by a tourist voucher. One has to dispose of an incontestable reputation. Criminals, drug addicts, inversions and perversions inclined persons, and those leading an immoral lifestyle don't let that bug you. But it's still not enough. A tourist should be a cool cat as well. Stress stands for the constant mental picture and various troubles imagined. How can one get rid of it? Our task is to convince all spaceflight participants that they work with reliable equipment and top-class specialists. That's what I'm always telling them. Guys, you're heading to space for pleasure. Villa Liberté needs no long explanations. Entertaining people first in the streets and then on the circus arena, he became a nice shrink himself long ago. It's a piece of cake for him to find a correct approach to another person, even to his teacher. In the cosmonauts training center, each tourist is examined not only by psychologists. The rest of instructors need to make sure that they deal with an absolutely normal person before the final decision concerning spaceflight admission is made. Вот, окей. Вы запомните. Держите внимание. Please remember, there is no need to twitch. Smooth moves, that's what counts. No swinging to and fro. Let your thoughts shake, while actions should be to the point and accurate. There you go. It's necessary to provide the psychological compatibility of all crew members. Once Cosmonauts Training Center experts had to reject a candidate for a space tour due to his psychology-related issues. In particular, this happened when we were forced to remove the Japanese spaceflight participant. And he was substituted with gorgeous and divine Anusha, Anusha, as we used to call her. Ready, launch, four units. Anusha is a Russian nickname of Anusha Ansari. This flight turned out to be a great surprise for her. She was initially a member of the backup crew. The decision on her participation was made less than a month before the planned liftoff. How the first liberated woman of East Anusha Ansari was let off in space by her husband still remains a mystery to the whole Islamic community. September 18, 2006. These are the quotes from Anusha Ansari's diary the first female space tourist and the first declaration of love out of space. Five, four, three, I'm really flying. Two, I love you, Hamid. One, a soft lift, and I felt an incredible, overwhelming joy. The last stage of separation was like an abrupt movement. Zero gravity. This magical feeling of freedom makes everyone smile. Giggling, I floated slowly over my lodgement. Earth's fair sex population was literally absorbed with this diary. 30 million readers or even more regularly reviewed online those orbital notes. Anusha managed to miss out words so simple and sincere that her letters excited a lively, genuine interest.
whereas the main reader who Anusha really dedicated her space notes to was anxiously waiting for her on Earth. See her and I could talk to her and see how happy she is, it was uh, much better. Uh, so, but the question is definitely I missed her. And uh, based on what she's been describing, I'm very curious to go up there myself now, yes. The most amazing what I saw there is the way the universe looks on the night side of Earth. Stars here are just indescribably beautiful. It seems as though someone had scattered diamond dust over the black velvet cloth. Fine words indeed. Yet, common people would hardly head to the orbit and tell us how strikingly our planet looks like from the spacecraft window if it had not been for the Russian president who personally interfered in the Nasser and Roscosmos antagonism in 2001. On April 12, 2001, Vladimir Putin arrived in the Star City. The visit's purpose is to congratulate cosmonauts upon the 40th anniversary of the first human space flight. But there was also another goal. The president is expected to support the International Space Crew, which was involved in the Houston scandal. The president wished to Commander Musabayev, flight engineer Baturin and space tourist Tito to carry out a successful flight. The spacecraft's launch with the first tourist aboard was scheduled for April 28th. On April 17th, the crew was already in Baikonur. Here it is, the historic moment. I believe it's an honor to have a space tourist aboard, as it happens for the first time in history. But one wouldn't let Dennis enjoy the moment's historicity to full extent. NASA would force him to sign a humiliating paper. Thereby, he was obliged to indemnify the state for any possible losses in case if a tiny piece of equipment would be broken down through his fault. Meanwhile, from the High Tribune of the Congress, the very NASA administrator, Daniel Goldin, would accuse Tito of not being quite a patriot and not loving America. But Tito would not yield to these provocations, simply ignoring Mr. Goldin's angry paroxysms. Well, we're getting close. We're only about 11 days. It's really exciting. He had never approached his dream that close before. But NASA would make another attempt to delay the spacecraft's launch with the first space tourist aboard. In space, even most common things require a proper training and are codenamed in a special way. For example, the WC. According to the onboard technical documents, it's a cesspool cleaning and sanitation device. Besides, all actions are performed in strict accordance with instructions. The first part, when we do number one. We use it the same way as we did the whole operation. And the second part, when we do number two. There's an insert. Yeah. Wally mm -hmm. had to learn the sequence of operations by heart. Repetition, repetition, another one. Just like in circus, until you perform a number, you are forbidden to leave the arena. It turned out to be easy enough till the final. The lavatory pan works like a vacuum cleaner. In some, the lesson is learned well. L is up. I'm floating, I'm finished. I take down, then I do that again. Put head down there. Open here, take one. Close the door. It might sound strange, but it's the WC matter that would play a significant part in the confrontation of the two main space powers in spring 2001. It happened several days before the first space tourists lift off. According to the program, the Russian spacecraft that started from Baikonur Cosmodrome was to substitute in orbit the ISS Joint American Shuttle. Shuttle Endeavour was thought to vacate the moorage for Soyuz spaceship and head back to Earth. 
NASA suddenly corrected the program, leaving Endeavour docked to the ISS. Afterwards, NASA explained it on account of computer system malfunctions and asked Moscow to postpone the Russian spacecraft's liftoff for a day later, even though it was clearly impossible. Many experts claim that it was done deliberately. The NASA management ordered not to undock the shuttle from the station, which meant that another spacecraft was not able to link up. To put it bluntly, they didn't let us fly up. Another solution for docking supposed that Soyuz would pass to the second docking unit, only six meters aside the Endeavour's tail. In that case, a single inaccurate movement was enough to turn the ISS, the shuttle, and the spaceship itself into a giant mass grave. Under the given circumstances, the Russian chiefs suggested that Soyuz would spend supplementary 24 hours in automated flight mode. Although, if Endeavour did not undock within a mentioned time lapse, the spacecraft would have to be removed from the orbit and land off nominally. When, out of the blue, as they say, there came a blessing in disguise. Suddenly, a WC broke down aboard the shuttle. God is all-seeing and omniscient. A laboratory pan breakage on the shuttle. One can't fly that long without this device working properly, especially with six, seven people aboard. All in all, that team had to undock. Soyuz was launched in precisely calculated time on April 28, 2001. Gagarin's traditional Payekhali rang at 11.37 a.m. Moscow time. As soon as the spacecraft left the ground, Dennis Tito's girlfriend, beautiful Dawn Abraham, fell on her knees and burst into tears. It was like a presentiment. The first space tourist troubles were only about to begin. In general, it's worth being pointed out that the space tourists are lucky to have special women by their side. For example, Charles Simony's beloved one, American anchorwoman Martha Stewart. In an incorrigible adventures, the author of books and filmmaker, and in addition, a millionaire. She accompanied Simony to Baikonur, then visited the mission control center to see her fiancé in the orbit and even declared her love for him via space communication before a great number of people. I just want you to know that we all think that you are intrepid, a pioneer, and above all, guess what? You're out of this world. Martha, it's really an honor to be here at the Shortly after the space flight, 58-year-old Simony did become engaged, although not to Martha, but to 28-year-old Swedish model Lisa Pear's daughter, his friend's daughter. Every single day after that, wanted to meet me, and I said, no, 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 but uh, so we actually just, we've been friends, and he's been a kind of a mentor for me during these years, but it's during the last year that... If an ordinary billionaire, Simony never managed to win the beauty's heart, Simony the cosmonaut succeeded in it quite easily. According to one version, Lisa, charmed by all the tales about sunrises and sunsets seen from the orbit, asked jokingly for a star as a present. Shortly after that, Simony played the trick. He rushed back to Moscow and literally snatched a space trip from the hands of another tourist, Australian multimillionaire Nick Halleck, by paying five million dollars more. The Australian had a rough time and went home with nothing. Whereas Charles, grabbing the wedding ring and the cuddly toy, a seal, made his fiancé a present and had it for the ISS again. He's happy. That makes me happy. <laughs> Simony became the first space tourist in the Cosmonautics Chronicles who reached the orbit twice. On the landing site, Lisa, the most beautiful girl of Sweden, was waiting for her twice space tourist. She fell in love with Charles, a man twice her age, not because of his fortune. Lisa is not a poor girl herself, since her own father is a millionaire. Honestly, Charles Simony would hardly ever fly to space again due to Lisa's objection. This ban is a formal condition of their marriage contract. Which is not surprising because no wife would stand her husband spending $35 million on a pure entertainment. 
Papou, bouge pas. Perhaps that's why millionaire Guy La Liberté doesn't make haste to stamp his Canadian passport with a marriage mark. Meanwhile, his beloved Claudia has presently a rather strange marital status, either a married woman or a girlfriend. However, it didn't prevent her from bearing her free Guy two children. There are five kids altogether. So while the father clown is planning to make it for the orbit, Claudia is busy with a whole kindergarten in her hand, though the beauty doesn't mind. Arrive in space in two, only eight minutes is something else. And to know that, you know, the father of my children is in there, it's quite exciting. Gila Liberté is a happy man, as he's finally lucky to have such a devoted life's companion. He's never told that story before, but now, out of the blue, he decided to share it on the eve of his space flight. But what that triggered that moment was uh, the separation uh, with the mother of my first three kids. So that was a difficult moment. It was emotional, you know. Was, uh... Guy just couldn't go on like that. He was ready to do the worst thing. When suddenly, he recalled the custom of Islanders. And a little bit like uh, in the Pacific Island native people, there's, uh, and as you know, they tattoo themselves, and they associate tattooing your body as, as changing skin like a snake, change sna uh, skin in order to regenerate his, his, his healthy skin. All my emotion of the first 40 years old in my life, I asked her to do a, uh, a painting, and then I went and see uh, my friend tattoo artist and showed him the painting and said, I want you to paint that on my back. I did become a literally another person, and it was then that I realized that I desperately needed a new challenge I'd love to experience on my own. The adventure that only six Earthlings happen to live through. I've got to perform the best stunt of my life. The serious troubles would seize the first space tourist, Dennis Tito, on the 45th second of the flight. Overflowed with intense impressions, Tito started turning his head to and fro, simply ignoring all the given instructions, and got an unrestrained vomit outburst. Luckily, an American medicine that Musabayev had spared in his pocket came to the rescue. After the docking and embarking aboard the station, Tito failed to overcome his exceeding curiosity and, despite all the necessary precautions, started rambling around the modules at random. Observing those childish rushes of delighted Tito, accompanied by Musabaya flying after him in different directions, the American crew members at once nicknamed the latter the first space babysitter. Then Musabayev drew away from his duties. All of a sudden, I felt somewhat subconsciously that something was wrong. I turned around and saw Tito's figure just like in binoculars, because the station takes after a huge pipe. So I saw a little man spinning around. That's from here that Dennis tried to fly over to the communicating module. Due to still disturbed coordination when attempting to pass through it, Dennis happened to scratch his head badly against the spring sticking up for just a millimeter. I've never seen aboard a human being with a huge blood bubble on the head. Both were of almost equal size. And then his blood started to fly chaotically about the station. You know, it's zero gravity, and liquids never pour down on the floor. My eyes popped out in terror. Dennis himself was as if bewildered by shock. So he was screaming. Well, of course, we rushed to help him. This time, the whole crew hastened to save Dennis Tito. Moreover, the Americans had to thereby violate their special duty regulation. It was forbidden to them to enter in any conversation with a space tourist. It goes without saying, no aid assistance was supposed either. However, the wound mess never stopped there. In 40 minutes, the ISS was to carry out a communication session with Earth. It was clear to everyone that if Nasser had seen Dennis Tito, his head bandaged, they would make a scene and demand his immediate removal from orbit. Certainly, they wouldn't fail to use any excuse in order to 
if to put it mildly, rule out the very possibility of future space tourists' flight participation, making illusions like, remember, what happened to Dennis the pioneer. Consequently, the first space tourist scratch hat turned into a political issue. Besides, no one knew how to sort things out. On the one hand, it was stupid enough to send Tito out like that. On the other, hiding him could also excite suspicion among the ground-based authorities. A genuine solution was found, a baseball cap to cover the bandage and the plaster. But Tito refused to wear it at the session, as it had a label Pizza Hut. He's not a pizza deliverman, he's a billionaire. Well, necessity is the mother of invention. So I said, Yura, find me an insulating tape instantly. He brought it red-colored and scissors. Then we taped the label so it looked like a red guard's cap band, and thank God, Tito agreed to put it on. Later on, there was a descent from the orbit, an emergency trajectory's alteration, which caused an enormous overshot of the initial landing point. Then another trajectory alteration applied in order to compensate the above-mentioned error. Seven-fold overloads were literally flattening out the cosmonauts. Vibration turned the dashboard into a solid black field. One could make sure that the first space tourists survived only on the ground. Dennis, that was your flight! Best of all, with. I was in paradise, Tito was exclaiming after landing. He was alive and felt like the happiest earthling. Oh, NASA, no big deal. The next day, Tito became a national hero of two countries, the United States and Russia. Eight years later, after the first space tourist Dennis Tito's flight, NASA Administrator Charles Bolden would arrive at Baikonur for the first time in the history of NASA and Roscosmos bilateral relations. The newly appointed chief manager, the first foreign trip, and right away to Russia. Oh, mama. Oh, mama, mama blue. Oh, mama. Charles Bolden came to be present at the spacecraft's launch with the crew and the seven space tourists aboard. That would mean that there are no more disagreements between the two leading space powers. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. Though there will no longer be the space tourism in the form it existed for the past eight years, which doesn't mean it's the final chord. The age of space tourism is not over. On the contrary, it will develop further, I'm sure. There were a lot of offers to Roscosmos concerning different flight options and space tourism variations. Someone would like to buy spacecraft hiring a crew commander. Others consider a possibility of linking up with the ISS whereas the rest plan to work in the Earth's orbit without docking. This is a prototype of a tourist spaceship. Initially developed for the military and named Almaz Diamond in English, it's perceived presently as the most promising machine intended to carry to the orbit crews with already two space tourists aboard. Right now you can see a shuttlecraft which has been tested in space. Altogether, there were implemented nine space flights. One capsule carried out three landings successfully. It means that this system is reusable. In 2015, such a spacecraft is to be carried to the launch pad and placed in orbit. the seventh space tourist, has symbolically turned over the dividing page of space tourism chronicles. It's high time humankind started afresh. What's the thing you're dangling in front of you? Sir, it's a weightlessness indicator, a toy lion. 
My kids used to sleep with it so that it could keep home scent during a six-month mission. Lions and clowns for the first time in the orbit. Toys here come alive and can fly. While common water turns into magic balls that look like tiny transparent copies of Earth. A brief circus number unexpected even for the clown himself. Only once in season, in the orbit exclusively. Clowns look at the world not through pinky glasses, but water lens. Alles up. Time shall pass, and people will be flying into space on trade union tours. Life has slightly amended these words of Sergei Karolev. In fact, Earthlings did undertake orbital voyages, but as space tourists. Meanwhile, absorbed by our daily routine, we never mentioned that in the beginning of the third millennium, there had come a new era on Earth. Madam Barilla, could you imagine your husband clown being on equal terms with professional cosmonauts in space? You know, you could have had two cosmonauts that didn't want, you know, a clown to accompany them. But they have, he brought something new, something fresh. Moving, ciao, bye-bye, everybody. 